All right, so last time, I think the time before, we did stuff with a custom class. And the whole idea is, is we were making components that we could use and reuse to do the job that we had to solve, but also give us code that we might be able to reuse in the future. The ASP.NET framework already has a lot of components built into it. It has things for text boxes, it has things for drop downs, it has things for validation, it has a calendar control, and so on. Those are very general things that many web applications could use, right? I mean, a lot of web applications could have a calendar on it. <clears throat> so the framework has that built into it, which means that you don't have to invent a calendar from scratch. You could all do that, all right? Um, but it would take a lot of work, and if someone already did that for you, that's great, right? Why, why reinvent the wheel? So you get the you get the benefit of it being done in a consistent manner. You get the benefit of it being really tested very strongly, and um, you get the advantage of you don't have to do everything from scratch. Now, of course, you still have the option to do things from scratch, right, if the building component doesn't work for you, all right? Or you can try to take the component and make it work for you. So that's sort of like the three options. In some cases, you might be lucky and be able to use the component just as it is. In other cases, you might be able to take it and with a little bit of your coding, get it to work the way exactly the way you want it to do. Finally, there's the all bets are off, I'm going to write it myself. All right? So you have all three of those options anytime you have that. And for most really simple, simple, generic sort of things, a component does a pretty good job by itself. Like if you're just validating to make sure that a field was required, use a required field validator. I, I don't really know why you would want to write your own code for that. All right? Some of the other controls, well, maybe you would want some sort of custom behavior for. So what we're going to do now is we're going to continue. Um, along the path that we were, where we're going to write some of our own components. And these components aren't generic components, stuff that's going to be used in a lot of applications, but stuff that are going to be used for the specific things that we're doing. All right? For example, we did a, a DICE class. Well, you know, there's some websites that use DICE, but that's not really a common thing compared to websites that do validation or websites that do calendars. So we have to make our own component for that. And hey, that's okay, right? Because if you get a tool or a set of tools that does a certain percentage of the work for you, then you spend your time working on the stuff that you need to write and need to work on. But you try to do it in a reusable way so that if elsewhere in your application you need to have a pair of dice to play a dice game or five dice to play Yahtzee, or two dice to play Monopoly, or whatever, you've already had a start in creating that. And you can simply just take and use what you've already created. So essentially, when we create these uh, uh, custom classes, we're creating our own components that we can use in our application. Um, and that's what we're doing. So let's look at ours. We took a pretty simple example. The more you have those classes, the more you'll be able to do with this. Let's look to see what we had originally, and let's build upon it. I don't remember exactly where we left off, but we'll take a look. So let me go and open.
recreated. Oh, that's not what I wanted. We created a dice class, and we created a high-low game class. And I think we got through the one example using it. So let's revisit this. All right. To make sure it works, first of all, from the perspective of the behavior, we shouldn't see any difference. So when I run this, it should act the same way that it did before. So I pick low and play, I won, I pick seven and play, I've lost, seven again, I've lost again, and so on. We have two classes, the dice and the game. What's the advantage of doing it in two classes instead of one? Could we have done this in one class? Sure. Why did I choose to do it in two classes? Yes. Maybe you want to reuse the dice. Yeah, because there's definitely the potential for me to use a dice again. Because what do you do with a dice? All right? A dice has its value. All right? A dice, you can roll. A dice remembers its value. In other words, it stays at whatever the value is until you roll it again. And then finally... In our case, we get the name of the image associated with the face of the dice that's showing. If we were making a Monopoly game, or a Yahtzee game, or any other dice game, would we want to need any more behavior from the dice class? Probably not, because you do the same thing. with. We would do the same thing with the dice object, right? Now, in Yahtzee, we would have five of them, and would roll five of them to start out. And then we decide which ones we want to re-roll. But for each of them, we want to be able to roll the dice. We want to get the value of it. And then finally, we want uh, to know the image associated with it so we can display it on the screen. So either we get the value or the image, depending on how we want to display it on the screen. So that's pretty much all you do with the dice, right? And therefore, we now have this anywhere we need a dice game. So if we wanted to make a Yahtzee game, we could go and we could do that. We'll make the start of a Yahtzee game at the end of class today just to show you what I mean. We won't go through and, and, uh, and uh, finish it. All right? Okay. So, that is a component by itself. Remember, a component is typically going to be the most useful and the most reusable when it does something very specific. If we were to include this code in the high-low game class, that means all we could do is play the high-low game, and we couldn't use the dice without playing the high-low game. And we might want to use the dice for a bunch of different games. So instead, we have the high-low game uh, code separate. What's the high-low game contain? Well, it contains two dice, All right, because that's what the game consists of. We can play the game, and in order to evaluate if you want or not, you need to know the user's choice. So that's an argument to the function. So the argument to the play function is the user's choice, whether they picked high, low, or seven. What happens when we play that game? And remember, we role-played this last time. We had people being the rolls of the dice, in, in the role of a, a dice, and the game said, dice one roll, dice two roll. What value did you get? We did the code to look to see if the user choice was low, if it was less than seven, and they won. If it was equal to seven, then, and so on down the line. 
And then finally, we return the result. Now, we needed a couple other functions in here. We have to ask the game, what's the value of the one dice, and what's the value of the other dice? What is the image associated with the first dice? What's the image associated with the second dice? And notice all that does is that asks the dice, hey, return your image. This is called, in object-oriented terms, delegation. So I ask the game, what's the value of the first dice? The game asks the dice object, hey, what's your value? Same thing for the second dice. When we implement this, the code in the game, notice how our code is much, much, much smaller now. All we do is we grab the user's choice, we create our game object, we play the game, and we pass it the user's choice, we get whether they won or lost. Remember, the return value of H play is a boolean. Notice I don't have to say if that equals true. This is already a Boolean. So this will already be true or false. If it's true, then we have a winner. Otherwise, we have a loser. Finally, when we're all done, we grab the images from the dice, or from the game object, and set the images on the screen to that. This is a characteristic, sort of, of good programming that our event handler doesn't have a lot of code in it. There's a little bit of code in it, but mainly the event handler calls other functions to do the job. All right? The, the event handler is sort of the glue that glues our user interface together with our business objects. All right? So it doesn't do a lot of the work on its own. It, uses other class and uses other things to do its job. Questions about this? Let's go and convert this one. I'm going to start out and I'm going to copy this code. And I'm going to put it in here. And I have to make some changes, because I don't have a drop-down. I have a radio button. Radio button list one. My results go into label four, if I'm not mistaken. And I set, I'm not setting an image, but I'm going to set text box 2 and 3 to the value of the dice. No, not a text box label. I don't want the image, because if you remember, this one didn't have an image. This one had a label. All right, I got the wrong name for a function. Let's go back and look for that. Get value dice 2. Cannot, oh, we have to cast that to string. This is one thing that you can sort of do that's, that comes in handy a lot of times, is you can sort of chain, chain instructions together. This part of the instruction returns an integer. Well, we need that converted string. So we could create an integer variable, get the value of the dice, and then put that integer variable to string. Here we're doing it in a chain. This is going to return an integer. We're going to take that integer and convert it to string. 
Now, I think there's one more thing that we need in our high-low games function, and that is to get the total. All right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a function here. And sometimes that happens because, well, we need the total value of the dice too. So I'm going to create a get total method that simply sums up the two dice and returns a value. Now, I could have put that code in here because I have the two values. But you might as well put it on the game object just in case other places that's needed. So now... We have two games, two versions of this game, both which have a different user interface. Default 2 has a radio button for our selection and displays the values. I might have did that a little backwards, but the total is the first one. These two are the to and then that message says if we want or not. This one accepts the input from a radio button and displays the results as text. Default accepts the value from a drop down and displays as images. So the inputs and the outputs can be totally different, right? But the logic of how the game plays is exactly the same. All right? So the logic of how the game plays is exactly the same. If we made a mistake in the logic, if, for example, we had in here greater than or equal to 7, for example, all right, instead of 7, We wouldn't have to go and change that in 10 different places once we found that there was a problem. We would make the change in one place, and that would work. If the rules of this game changed, and again, you think of a game, and typically the rules don't change, but it's possible the rules could change um, for whatever reason. There's only one place to put that in. In this case, the business logic, again, problem domain logic is another way to put it, the logic of the game is separated from the user interface. So we can plug any user interface we want to into the game. And as long as it can supply the user's choice, and as long as it has somewhere to put the results, we can do it. We might display an image if they won versus lost, for example. Well, that's okay. That's a user interface thing. The game is just responsible for playing the game, telling the results. The user interface is responsible for deciding and implementing how it's going to display that to the user. Questions about this? <coughs> now, if we were going to do this for a Yahtzee game, let's say, we're not going to do the whole game, but we're going to start it off. All right, I'm going to go in, I'm going to create file, new, file, class, Yahtzee, Yahtzee instead of Two dice, I have five dice.
to create a new web page for Yahtzee. It matters where you click new, by the way. I don't know if you noticed that. I was in this code file and click new file, and I got these choices. I didn't see the choice I wanted, which was a uh, web form. So if I go in the application, instead of clicking in the app code and click new file, then I get what I want. So I'm going to create a Yahtzee game. Now, Yahtzee game, simply put, has five images in it. So the five. Here's a neat trick. If I go and copy this, it will automatically adjust the ID of it. Image two, image three, image four. I can put a button on here. And when I click on the button, I can create a new Yahtzee game. Yahtzee Y equals new Yahtzee. What does that mean again? Well, I'm creating a new member of this class. So all the functions, etc., that are available in there are available here. So, I can roll, so I can say y.roll, which will go and roll all the dice. That starts with a cat one. Or not. I think it's play. There we go. Or not. I'm just going to go home. I'm, I've had enough of this. I forgot the play function. Public void? What does void mean? Doesn't return anything, correct. So, I forgot to put a roll all here. And that's simply going to be roll d1. Choose how many dice you keep. 
you can choose which ones to keep and which ones to re-roll. So if we were coding that, what would we do? What would we do to our user interface? What would we do to our custom class? We'd have to somehow in our user interface indicate which ones we wanted to keep and which ones we wanted to roll, right? How do you think we would do that? Click on the image or not? You might click on the image. What's another way you might do it? Have a checkbox. Have a checkbox next to each one. So I might have five checkboxes. One, two, three, four, five. And if I checked it, I guess depending on how you want to write the code, either that would mean keep it or re-roll it. Right? Which one which one do you think makes more sense? Check means to keep it. Okay, so we would have five checkboxes then. If we checked it, that means that you keep it. If you left it unchecked, you would re-roll it. What would we need for the... What would we need to do in the custom class then? Right now, our roll function rolls all five of them. Right? Pardon me? You could just create a re-roll method. You'd create a re-roll method. Okay. Now, the re-roll method um, will look something like this, right? But, how would it be different? Because this one rolls all of them. Checkbox is true, but don't. Okay, if the checkbox is true. Now, that's, that's a true statement. However, Let's say I try to do that and I say if checkbox one or something like that. This class doesn't know anything about the checkboxes, right? Because the checkboxes are over on this page. And this class doesn't know anything about the checkboxes on this page. So what would we have to do? Yes? Uh, you, you would create a bool variable that can pass to the role? Right you would pass arguments. So you would pass five booleans based on what checkboxes were checked. You would pass five booleans to that function. True means re-roll, false means keep it, or something like that. All right? Um, I think we have time to do that. Why not? So I'm going to go here. going to make a list, because really that's what this is. This is a list that has an Li, and each Li consists of an image, and a checkbox. five times. Now, for simplicity, I'm going to make a re-roll button. So 
going to go add a reroll button. Where'd my button go? I needed my button. We have a little bit of a problem because because my butt got accidentally deleted. It no longer knows that the code that I wrote a minute ago belongs to this. So I'm going to have to tell it. send over the, the value of the checkboxes. And that is the checked attribute. Now the way this is going to work is it's going to re-roll it if it's checked, which I think might be the opposite of what we said, but that's what we got. So now I need a function in my Yahtzee game. It says reroll and accepts five arguments. That indicates whether I want to reroll that or not.
actually keep coming up with this because way long time ago I right mouse on that and I said set a start page. So that's convenient if you're debugging a certain page that you know you are. So I'll right mouse on this and say set a start page. And I'll run this. My roll gives me those dice. I click that and click reroll. Hmm. something weird with the way that it, the ran, well, the way I'm creating the objects. So I will, I'll play with this and, and get it working for you and show it to you on Tuesday. Yes? So that check property that you're passing in, uh -huh. is that asking if it's checked or is it telling it that it's checked? It's telling it that it's checked. So no, 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 no. It's asking if it's checked. Okay. It's all five of them are getting three more. Yeah, it, it is. It, what it what it relates to is the way that the objects are being created. I have to I have to think of how. I I have to see how. Um, in a nutshell, I'm recreating. The, I'm recreating the. Let me try this real quick. I'm recreating the the. Yahtzee object every time I open the page. It's not where you, it's not where you have to add a static to it, is it? Um, maybe, but I don't think so. If this doesn't make any sense to you, don't worry about it. This is mainly I got annoyed that this doesn't work and I want to fix it because <laughs> I forgot something. Uh, let's try this. So I roll. I will re-roll these three, let's say. Yeah, still a problem. I'll debug it and post the results of it if I can. Or I will erase the tape from the point where I started talking on this on and claim that we did not talk about this at all. Alright? One of the two things. Alright. At any rate, I think you get the sense uh, of what I was trying to get at, the reusability. And notice we didn't have to do anything with the dice. We just assumed that the dice worked. Alright? So, uh, that's really the, the good thing about this. What I'd like to do today, and what we'll get on to next week, is talk a little bit about the project and talk about um, talk about uh, what the requirements of the project is.
But talk about some components in the .NET framework that's going to make your life easier than maybe when you did the project in CISS 2.16. Okay? So let's pull up. the project, which is under modules, the, I know you've all read this. semester you'll create a small database driven web application using ASP.NET. Another word for, well I don't want to say another word for, a database driven web application is a, is, is a, a certain kind of dynamic website. Okay? When I say database driven it means that things aren't hard coded but things come from the database. For example, Let's say you wanted to create uh, a, uh, an online store, all right? You would not have three product, let's say you sold three products. You would not have three separate product pages, product one, product two, product three, that were hard-coded. Product one shows product one information, product two shows product two information, and so on. You would have a single product page that retrieved the data from the database and formatted it and displayed it depending on which program uh, product the person chose. All right, that's what I mean by database driven. All right, so you're not going to have duplicate code. You're not going to have a bunch of pages that all look the same. Because if you think about it, does Amazon have a page for every product that they sell? Of course not. It'd be ridiculous. You can't imagine that, right? How many new products? How many new books come out every week? How many new DVDs come out every week and so on. It'd be impossible to do that. Instead, they have a dynamic page, a database driven page that based on certain criteria pulls up the appropriate product that the person wants to see. So one piece of code that has a basic shell and fills in the blanks from the database. All right. Now we don't know how to do that yet, but we will soon. And trust that we'll be able to do that by the time the project comes along. So you will have a database-driven project. Decide on a purpose for your project and be creative. It could be about a hobby, bulletin board, online poll, online catalog, almost anything else. It doesn't have to do everything. All right? It doesn't have to do everything. For example, if you created an online store, it wouldn't have to like actually process orders and ship stuff, all right, and stuff like that. Maybe just an online catalog would be enough, where the user could look for an uh, online uh, catalog, I mean, would be enough, where the user can search your products, maybe search by category, maybe put in the name of the product and see if you have it, and then click on it and see the details of it. So if you want to do an online store, it doesn't have to do everything that a real online store does, but you'll pick some functionality and you'll implement that completely. All right? Whatever it does, it should do completely, but it doesn't have to do everything. All right? It doesn't have to do everything. All right? uh, people in my class before did something like where they um, compared uh, two sports teams. You know, the people I'm, I'm thinking of like compared the Cavs with the Golden State. And it showed the players by position side by side and showed the statistics and so on so you could match them up and see who was going to win. All right? Now, in that case, they didn't have to enter the statistics. I, I'm sorry. Let me rephrase that. They, their application didn't have, didn't have to allow them to enter the statistics. They could go into access and just put the statistics in that way. All right? But their application did a comparison and so on and so forth. 
So you don't have to complete a, you don't have to finish a, a, a comprehensive complete application. Just pick an aspect of it and do that part of it and do it um, completely. Um, oh my God, I don't believe this. Or too small, TWO. Wow, I must have been having a tough day that day. I got, and the funny thing is, I got too large right. All right. But when I looked at that, that just stuck out too small. All right. The big problem that people are going to have, that they consistently have, is either they pick something that is really way too ambitious, or they pick something really small. Like, I want to enter my friends, you know, and their phone numbers, and that's it. You know, okay, but, you know, that's not really sufficient for a project. You know, you need a more substantial database. Or you have people that say, I want to, you know, essentially duplicate eBay, you know, or duplicate Amazon or whatever. And it's like, well, slow down. All right. So if you need help either expanding or narrowing down your project idea, let me know. And we'll, uh, and we can work together. The project will consist of two parts, design and the completed project. Each part is worth, six, is worth 20 points. I don't think that's true. All right. Uh, I think I changed that and forgot to change this. Each part is worth, I think the design is worth 15, no, the design is worth 10, and the completed project is worth 20. Okay, so that is, that is mistaken. I apologize for that. I'll try, uh, I will, in fact, I should just make these corrections now and re-upload them. Okay, your design will consist of this. A few paragraphs that describe the purpose of your application. And we'll address the goals of your site for your users. So I'm going to write, uh, you know, I'm going to write an application that compares the Golden State Warriors with the Cleveland Cavaliers. It will show by position, side by side. This way, um, users can come and view this, you know, uh, to see what the matchups are, to get an idea of what to expect in the game. Um, if you're not familiar with, um, you know, either team, that will give you more information about them, and so on. So focus on the user goals, like. Why someone, why someone would visit your page, all right? An entity relationship diagram for your database. How many of you add the CISS 143? Okay, so we'll talk about entity relationship diagrams. It's simply sort of a chart that describes what your database is going to look like, all right? So you'll need that diagram that defines the structure of the database. A listing of what pages are going to be in your application with a description of each page. Please review the requirements of the completed project in determining what page that you'll have. And then finally, a prototype of the home page and at least two other pages. The prototype doesn't have to be a completed web page. You could just mock something up in Word or in HTML or whatever. It doesn't have to be ASPX pages. All right. It should just give me an idea of what the site is going to look like. You'll do that for the home page and at least two other pages. All right. So that's what you'll have, four pieces. An overview, an entity relationship diagram, a list of the pages that are going to be on your site, and a prototype. Now, you need to, in your completed application, have the following things. A master page. I'm going to scrap the sitemap page. Four other pages. 
at least four other pages. I'm going to, yeah, um, I'm going to change that to, because I got rid of the sitemap page, I'm going to change that to five other pages. At least five pages. Each of which interact with the database. Now, for example, if you have a home page, that's fine. But if it doesn't interact with the database, it doesn't count towards those five pages. So you need five database interacting pages. You need to do the following within your application. Do a query based on some criteria. Perform inserts, updates, and deletes. Show header and detail. A query based on criteria would be, let's say I'm not going to show every player for the Cavs in Golden State, but I'm going to pick a position and it will show me all the players of that position. So I might have a drop down with forward, guard, center, I pick center, it will show me the centers for both teams. That is a query based on a criteria. If I have an online catalog, I might type in a product name or part of a product name. And when I hit enter, it will show me the products that, mark, that match that product name. That's an example of a query based on a criteria. All right? Simply returning everything in the database is not a query based on a criteria. It's a query, but it's not based on a criteria. So you need some sort of criteria to narrow down what you're showing from the database. Insert, update, and delete. That should be straightforward enough. Be able to add things to the database, be able to change things in the database, and be able to delete things from the database. Finally, show header and detail. What I mean by that is you should show, for example, Information about the Cleveland Cavaliers, that's the header information, and the detail would be a list of all their players. Another example, these are the biographies in my database. Here's a list of all the biographies. So you'd show information about the category and then all the members of that category. That's what I mean by header and detail. Essentially, in database terms, you're showing the stuff for a one-to-many relationship. Now, these obviously go together, right? These different things. One and three especially. I could do a query based on team and choose to see the Cleveland Cavaliers. And then the next page would show me information about the Cavaliers, information about the players on the team. So the query, the header and detail can go together. Now... These two requirements go hand in hand, right? So if you need, you, if you do these things, but you only have three pages, then you get points deducted because you don't have five pages. If you have five pages, but all of them simply output every piece of data from a different table, you haven't satisfied this criteria. So you may have more than five pages, all right? if you need additional pages to satisfy these criteria. Does that make sense? You have to do both of them. It should look professional, employ good coding practices, be accessible and cross-browser compatible, should be fully functional and fulfill the stated purpose. It does not have to do everything, but what it does it should do completely. So my site is to compare the Cavaliers and Golden State Warriors, maybe there's a piece of it it doesn't do. Maybe you're not able to add new players, for example. Uh, or you'd have to add new players manually through the database. But if it did those other things correctly, then that would be considered a good project. Questions on that? Take the time to reread this. Some of these things you don't know how to do right now. And I, I recognize that that makes designing it a little bit scary, in a way. That's where I come in. If you are overambitious in what you're going to do, then I'll let you know. All right. Likewise, if you haven't gone far enough, I'll let you know that as well. Trust, by the end of the semester, we will have covered all these things. 
all right? And they're not impossible to do. So if you create, if you say, for example, that you have a website um, that uh, users can put comments about the different teams, the Lakers and the Cavaliers. And I said, well, Lakers, Gold State, whatever, uh, or Cavaliers. Well, trust that by the end of the semester, yeah, that's something you'll be able to do. All right, that would be an example of inserting data into the database. Maybe deleting would be that the administrator can go and delete comments if they're abusive, all right, and so on. Please take the time to read this. We're going to start talking next time about some of the things in the framework that will help us build our user interface better. All right? Uh, things such as master pages and navigations and things like that. So we'll talk about those components next time. We will also, uh, I also intend to have that thing fixed that, um, that wasn't working today. All right? Okay, that's all I have. Uh, we'll see you in a minute. This is a rare day indeed for me finishing early. Usually I go overtime.